And at this point, we will begin our first round of questions. The chair recognizes herself for five minutes. Um, well, thank you again to all the witnesses for being here today. According to the fourth National Climate Assessment, projected increases in inland flooding over the coming century is estimated to result in an average annual damages of 1.2 to 1.4 billion each year by 2050. And as a result of sea level rise, coastal storms and high tides have already amplified coastal flooding and erosion. The Pacific Northwest and my home state of Oregon, which I noticed on your map, Mr. Branfort, didn't have a lot of green in your LIDAR mapping. Um, we have a challenging history of flooding. Uh, some as a result of early snowpack melt, increased precipitation and warm temperatures in the spring. The mighty Columbia River, in fact, completely engulfed the community of Vanport uh, in 1948. It crested 15 feet higher than the floodplain jeopardized the livelihoods of thousands of residents. Then in 1996, I remember this one, the Willamette River flooding saturated the region, resulting in evacuations, mudslides, and significant property damage. In rural Columbia County, in 1996 and, and 2007, there was serious flooding from the Nehalem River uh, in Vernonia. It destroyed homes and schools in 2007, and then they had another major flood in 2015. And just earlier this month, Oregon declared a state of emergency in several counties as a result of flooding that had already occurred uh, this year. We can only expect that these events will become more extreme and more frequent with the climate crisis. So uh, first, according to the National Academy's report from last year titled Framing the Challenge of Urban Flooding in the United States. FEMA mapping methods for river and coastal flood hazards do not currently consider distinctive urban flood hazards. So Mr. Burgeon is how could FEMA better address the growing urban flood risk? Urban flood risk is a topic that's um, evolving very significantly. Actually, uh, when, when I go out and um, talk to our chapters, one of the things that has, stricken, uh, has, has struck me over the last couple of years is almost everybody says, you know, it's one thing we would design our infrastructure for one to two inches of rain an hour, but we're seeing rainfall events that give you three to four inches in a half hour. How do we, how do we deal with that? Um, and the National Academy study is one of three studies, actually, that came out in the last uh, 12 months or so. Um, there's also one by the um, University uh, of Maryland, and the ASFPM Foundation just released a report a couple weeks ago on that. And, and I mention those because they're exploring different dimensions on it right now in the practitioner community. There actually isn't a lot of agreement on how we address uh, urban flooding. There's a couple takeaways that we have, I think, on the practitioner side. One, um, the federal government can probably provide tools and resources but there is a clear um, preference of not having something that emerges from the federal government that's regulatory. Um, so uh, because a lot of the stormwater management and the land use mass management associated with urban flooding is really done at that local and sure, state Sure, it varies level. a lot, I'm sure, from, yeah, exactly. from area to area. So, so that would be, I would say that would be about the area of consensus right now is kind of okay. tools and resources, but right. not regulatory. Thank you. And Mr. Osler, how could federal science agencies, including NOAA, help FEMA better incorporate climate trends into urban flood risk assessments? I think one of the key areas where we can collaborate, I think, more closely is that we see connections in the day-to-day -day at the practitioner level, but organizationally we have uh, a greater need to be directed, I think, to have direct linkages. A lot of our programs between FEMA and NOAA are complementary, and they have grown up in recognition of each other, and yet that is a, that's people just paying attention to good government as opposed to a strict mandate of how that linkage should happen and might happen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get another question in. The climate crisis is changing the frequency and intensity of flooding. Floodplains are no longer as static as perhaps they were when the National Flood Insurance Program was created in 1968. So Mr. Burgeon is, is focusing on whether a property is or is not in the 100 or 500 year floodplain and accurate use of the best available science, or is the 1% annual chance flood the most appropriate indicator of high flood risk areas today? 
Well, again, there's a lot of debate. And interestingly, there is a trend that we're starting to see some communities, especially those that are feeling the effects of climate change, moving to a higher standard, such as the 500-year flood elevation. Uh, most recently, Houston uh, and Harris County have done that. Um, the city of Austin is doing that temporarily uh, until they get new flood maps that reflect the current conditions. Thank you. And I'm going to try to set a good example and yield back the balance of my time. I have an additional question. I'll 